Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. So the real estate market and what the heck is going on is probably one of the number one topics that everyone's talking about these days in uh, in Toronto and probably, frankly, um, you know, across North America, if not uh, even wider than that. Uh, the Sunday New York Times even last week had a whole section on what people thought was going to be happening with the real estate market in the United States, where they're saying it's overpriced and it's even higher priced in Canada. So I thought we'd uh, connect out with uh, connect in with uh, two people uh, who I know and respect in the real estate business. Uh, first of all, Katie Davidson, who owns her own brokerage company called Real Agency. And she's got an interesting fee structure that uh, we're going to talk about, but she also uh, you know, is very knowledgeable on what's going on in the real estate uh, market. And then I want to introduce you to Julian Bastian, Batistan, Batistan, I apologize, who is the CEO of the Oben Group. And the Oben Group is a Toronto-based, vertically integrated real estate development and management company that's creating urban impact through the development, construction, and management of upscale, purpose-built rental and residential condominium uh, projects. And I wanted to check with him to see, you know, as, as condo pricing is potentially um, at risk and, 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 and or potentially going down, lots and lots of people have been talking about uh, purpose-built rental. And so I thought it'd be interesting to check in. So Katie, Julian, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us. How are you both? Good, well. thank you. Thanks, Brian, for having us. My pleasure. So, uh, Katie, let's start with you. Um, you know, we chatted a little while ago and I said, uh, you know, what's going on with the real estate market? And you said, uh, I think, uh, don't worry. Uh, but, you know, since then, interest rates have gone up by 100 basis points, maybe 150 basis points. Um, what do you think now? Well, it's kind of scary, isn't it? And it's continue continuing to go up. Um, I think we're going to probably this is going to be the new norm for a while. Um there's going to be probably another another hike coming soon, and uh, it's definitely taken its toll on the market. We've gone from being all, you know all excited and selling houses, putting it up for a day, and it was gone. Now we're back to I guess what we would call normal, uh, but we're not used to the normal. So we're we're averaging probably thirty to forty days on on market, and um, seller buyers are reluctant right now to make purchases. So inventory is still low, and we're we're definitely uh, slowing down, and uh, qualifying is becoming more challenging. So, you know, I I feel like buyers are having to adjust our expectations on homes that they thought they were going to be buying. So if they're looking at that four thousand square foot home or thirty five hundred square foot home, they're going to have to adjust their expectations to something that is going to qualify and be manageable for them. So, as you know, I've been looking um uh, for for real estate and I've been hunting around. And so I'm probably on a bunch of different, uh, you know, email lists and Instagram lists and all this kind of stuff. I get inundated probably once every four or five hours, maybe even more often with new price, better price, reduced price by uh, these emails and postings and whatnot. Um, has the market adjusted yet or are people reluctant to lower their prices to, to move the uh, inventory? You know, the psychological impact right now to sellers is pretty stressful because you know some of these uh, home sellers are have purchased homes in, in the higher price bracket prior to the whole interest rate hike and the home values have have been impacted and, and their expectations when purchasing was quite different than what's happening right now so i feel like um you know they're coming along but not where they need to be so price adjustments are happening but they're happening in small increments um, some of the sellers are, you know, it's a wait and see and, and, you know, buyers are kind of the same attitude as well. Julian, what about you? What do you think about uh, the real estate market, where it's going and, and what's happened to rental prices? Yeah. So in terms of uh, the, the real estate market, I mean, increased uh, costs have been a serious problem for the development industry well before, you know, the recent shift in, in the housing market. Uh, the difference, however, was that you know, new home buyers up until recently were able to absorb these these cost increases largely thanks to to lower interest rates. Uh, with these interest rate hikes, and I'm afraid you know we're we're hitting a tipping point, and I, I think the music, so to speak, is going to stop. And and at at some point, and I suspect very soon, uh, supply will start to taper off uh, or even even shut off. And you know, I think unfortunately. The, supply of uh, of of resale homes uh, or of new homes? Uh, no, of, of new. I'm talking about new new housing here. 
Um, and uh, you know, the, the development industry, I, I feel, has, has done a, a poor job, relatively poor job in, in educating the public as to really what's been behind uh, these, these steep increases uh, in home prices over the past several years. And, uh, you know, to put it in context, you know, we've seen over the past five years, construction costs increase over 58%. And a soft costs, which which are you know, basically everything other than land and construction costs, they're up seventy six percent. And a large part of that is is, is due to uh, to government related charges. So, yeah, we've seen development charges double, educational levies, so forth. And it's it's gotten to a point where these these government related fees account for twenty five percent of of a total sale price of a new condo in the city of Toronto. Um, that that's twenty five percent. Of the twenty five percent of a new condo are government fees, right? So and and so in other words, if you're buying a new condo uh, at let's say seven hundred thousand dollars, one hundred seventy five thousand dollars of that is going directly to the city and the provincial and federal government. So you know if if these governments don't start to change their their policies to compensate for the reduced uh, purchasing power of of consumers caused by raising uh, rising interest rates, we're going to see a considerable slowdown in, in new home starts uh, in the short term, which ultimately will exacerbate the, the housing shortage. And but, but most problems. people, because of interest rate increases and because our price prices have been so high anyway to start with, are thinking pricing is going to go down. What you're suggesting, Julian, is pricing is going to go up. Right. So we don't, as developers, we can't control building costs in the sense that, you know, we, we have to hire trades, we have to purchase materials. Um, we can't control obviously these government fees. There, there's very little in, in our power to, to, to impact costs. Uh, we're, 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 we're basically at the mercy of, of our trades and, and governments and, and, and various you know, other factors and inputs that go into a development project. Um, but like I said, you know, we, we were able to absorb those those costs uh, because they haven't gone down. To, our, our bottom line hasn't increased because we've raised our our, our home prices. In, in fact, our, our margins are actually coming down. Um, but you know, again, we've been able to to to, to handle this because of, of the ability for ultimately buyers to to absorb these prices. This this is going to stop. Um, you know, if, if people can't qualify for mortgages, um, yeah, we're, we're we're already starting to see launches. Uh, that have, that are basically flat. People are just are, are sitting and waiting, and um, and like Katie said, uh, I, I think just hesitant to make any move at the moment. So I've been, uh, you know, I don't know about the rental market, and I'd be interested in hearing about that later on. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, just like I get these emails that I was telling uh, Katie about in regards to price reductions, I've also got a bunch of emails lately where deposits have been reduced uh, for uh, condos. Uh, where they used to be charging 15 to 20 percent, they're now offering only five percent down. Um, so it seems like uh, you know developers, condo developers, are doing anything they can to get people to sign those uh, deals right now. Mm -hmm. No, uh, definitely. And you know the the other factor that we need to consider here is uh, our ability to to borrow and and finance these these projects. Um, obviously. You know, lenders are starting to get skittish. Um, uh, they they understand what's 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 going on in in the market. Um, they're uh, seeing the you know the, the fact that now a lot of their potential um, you know borrowers are 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 not uh, being able to qualify. So uh, it's a bit of a uh, <laughs> a scary place, let's say, in in the development um, industry right now. I mean, look, long long run, long term. I'm 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 really not concerned in the sense that I mean Toronto uh, I'm I'm still very very bullish uh, about it's a, it's a, it's a great city to live and work um, uh, we we will have you know uh, population increases uh, over the coming years uh, steep population increases which again is contributing to this this lack of supply housing supply but um, so no I mean uh, we're 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 talking kind of short term problems here and uh, I'm hoping that within the next kind of 12 or so months, things start to stabilize. We're chatting tonight with Katie Davidson of the Real Agency uh, Brokerage and Julian Battiston, uh, a, a developer of purpose-built uh, rental um, uh, apartments in the Toronto area. We're going to take a break for some messages and come back with Katie and Julian in just two minutes. Stay with us, everybody. 
We're talking tonight all about real estate. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. Tonight, we're talking all about real estate and primarily uh, real estate in the greater Toronto area. And my guests are Katie Davidson of the Real Agency uh, Brokerage. Uh, she specializes, Katie, what, in West Toronto, uh, Mississauga, Oakville? Uh, we're, we're in Halton. We're into the GTA, um, but primarily we we focus on in Halton and uh, probably Toronto West, I would say. And you've been in the real estate uh, just a few years, right? Yeah, a few years. <laughs> Have you have you have you been in the real estate industry through a uh, a down cycle before? I have, yes. What's uh, it like? Uh, you know, it, typically it's a shorter cycle than what we're experiencing. In 2017, we did experience one where you know everything was selling like hotcakes, and next thing you know, they introduced the foreign buyers tax, and then overnight we. Uh, you know, the whole market changed and shifted. Uh, but that was a shorter cycle. And I think it lasted maybe about uh, six months. But uh, right now, it's definitely a different situation. I think the interest rate hikes are a lot more aggressive and a uh, little bit more unknowns. And COVID uh, definitely, the shutdown over the last two years has had an impact overall on everything. As Julia mentioned, building costs, uh, inventory, uh, you know, buyer confidence and so on. Right. Um, and Julian uh, Battiston is uh, is also our guest tonight, and he is CEO of Odin Build, Odin Group, uh, Odin Flats, and uh, and Odin Shops, and Odin PM, uh, numerous different organizations within the Odin Group, and uh, and and Odin is primarily purpose built rental. But I was interested, uh, Julian, that you're also in the hotel business and in the retail business, uh, and so in the last couple of years, you know. Housing may be the issue today, but in the last couple of years, hotels have been devastated um, and retail has been hurt uh, with uh, COVID. Tell me how those two uh, divisions of your business have fared in the last couple of years. Uh, so just to clarify, actually, we're, we're not involved in hotels. Uh, we, we do have some retail um, that, uh, that that we manage, but um, uh, retail did uh, take a hit. Sorry, I apologize. Uh, it says with the personality of a boutique hotel. I there we go. <laughs> I misread the uh, Odin Flats uh, description. I apologize. Odin, Actually, Odin it's, Flats. it's Oben. Oben. Oben, Oben Flats. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, no retail. We 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 did have a few uh, tenants in, in the portfolio that um, you know that that were kind of hospitality related uh, or you know things like. Um, you know, dance studios or fitness centers. And, and, and clearly, you know, they, they weren't really going to be able to open their doors uh, in the middle of COVID. So, you know, we, we worked with them and uh, they're still there, there today. And, um, and they're starting to bounce, bounce back, which is, which is positive to see. What, um, what's going to happen if housing prices go down for condos? Is there more demand for rental or does rental go down as well? If, if condo prices go down, uh, we'll see less demand for rental. I mean, at, at the moment, uh, the demand, demand for rental is, is very high, um, you know, in large part because uh, I, I think potential you know, buyers or, 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 or individuals that were contemplating uh, purchasing a new home uh, are, are, are sitting back and, and waiting to see how things play out over the course of the next six or, or so months and turning to the, to the rental market. So you've got um, you know demand from that end. We also have increased demand because you know during the the pandemic we we saw a flight uh, as as we all know um, out of the city, and we a number of our buildings saw huge you know vacancy rates, and um, uh, you know these were students, these were uh, young professionals who were going to you know re work remotely and were in some cases moving back <laughs> into their their parents' home, a whole bunch of reasons. But in any event, you know, uh, we, we saw big vacancy rates, drops in retail and uh, rental rates, and and it's it's really really come back um, to actually uh, pre-COVID levels, and in, in some cases even beyond uh, pre-COVID levels from a, a, both the rent a rental rate and and vacancy. A low vacancy standpoint. So, um, you know, this is also because these these people who who fled the city over the last couple of years are coming back. You know, their 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 employers are telling them they have to come back to work. Uh, universities and colleges have opened up. 
And uh, so students are coming back to the city. So we're seeing a flood of new, uh, of new people come back into the city and look to rent in, in, in our spaces. And so the it, gas it, prices also impact, don't they? It's, you know, yeah, it's cool yeah, that, that could uh, definitely, gas yeah, definitely. prices are low. People commute to Niagara or Brantford or Georgetown, but when gas prices get higher, they, they don't like that as much anymore. Right. So, you know, I think the, the problem there, again, you know, talking about affordability is, and, and again, circling back to you know, development costs, um, we, we're going to have a shortage and we're already, we already have a shortage of, of, of rental stock in the city and elsewhere. Um, but the, the, really the metrics just don't pencil out to, to build new rental these days. So be, because of rising interest rates, rising uh, construction costs, so again, it's just it's another pressure, uh, added pressure on 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 housing and uh, housing affordability. Julian, I interviewed the chief economist of CMHC, and uh, they predicted that we need 1.8 million more homes than we would otherwise be building in the Greater Toronto Area, Southern Ontario Area, uh, in the next eight years to meet the growth and demand, the growth in population, et cetera, if we want to have uh, affordable homes and not affordable meaning social housing, but affordable uh, for all of us uh, that, uh, you know, that uh, 40% of our disposable income goes to uh, housing costs, not, not a greater amount. Um, how, given everything you've described, and and further, you know, you haven't talked about inclusionary zoning, which is an issue that uh, <laughs> the governments have imposed, and we can talk a little bit about mm-hmm. that. Um, I think there was a, a a vote a week or two ago that increased uh, the development charges by forty percent uh, in uh, the city of Toronto. Uh, so that's forty mm-hmm. percent a year. You were talking about over a couple of years that was the seventy percent increase, but forty percent in just one year. So with those kinds of uh, of increases um, in the development charges uh, with inclusionary zoning, with other taxes, um, and with the time frame that it takes to actually get a project through the approval process. Um, and, and, and from what I understand, lots of projects don't actually get approved by the city, have to go to uh, the Ontario Land Tribunal, and uh, that takes another year to two years uh, and a lot more money. How can we ever possibly dream of meeting this 1.8 million additional homes than would otherwise be built in this environment. Yeah, with with the current planning regime, uh, that's never going to happen. It, it, it'll be physically impossible. Uh, we're going to need a, a fundamental shift in, in how we look at and approach development in order to uh, achieve achieve that goal. Um, yeah, what could be done? Well, I mean, there are there are some some shifts that could be made on, on the government level. Uh, number one, we could start by re- reducing the, the obstacles uh, that, that, that we deal with when building both big and small projects and speed up the planning approval process, as you mentioned. You know, I, I think um, we, we need to depoliticize the, the planning process because you know, local politicians are, are not generally incentivized to encourage new housing. You know, they just, they, there's far too much pressure on them from their constituents to, to block New residential proposals uh, certainly doesn't help in, in, in that regard. Uh, we need to free up land and density. And, and something that, you know, we're talking about development charges, something that I, I think is important here is that um, charges uh, need to, to be proportionate to uh, the burdens created by new housing and, and that existing property owners are, are, are funding their fair share through property taxes. That's not happening right now. And, and, and politicians are you know, are, are always fearful of, of, of increasing and or talking about an increased property taxes. But at the end of the day, what they're doing is just ultimately shifting that burden onto developers by way of um, development charges. And what we do as developers, I mean, that, that, that fee or cost just becomes another line item on our budget. We ultimately download those to the, the, the purchasers. So uh, again, uh, contributing to affordability issues. So you know, th- these are big changes that that are required and, and require a lot of political will. And I'm, I'm just hoping that our, our leaders at, at all levels of government could step up to the task because there's otherwise no way we're going to achieve uh, those uh, those those uh, goals. So uh, I understand housing. that uh, the property taxes in Toronto, uh, residential property taxes, are lower than they are in most of the 905 uh, and uh, significantly lower than most of the 905. 
Um, and that is, as you've said, uh, because of political lack of uh, will or or just the desire to keep property taxes low in the city of Toronto, such that, you know, whoever, as a mayor of Toronto or a politician of Toronto, would ever get elected if they actually, you know, recommended sizable steep increases in residential property taxes. Like, mm-hmm. how? So you, you end up getting caught in this in this intractable problem you know what would you recommend uh, john tory do <laughs> like i said uh, you know these, these are all big uh, big changes and and difficult changes to make um ultimately you know something needs to be done and and you know we we have to grab onto some of these big and potentially contentious items and and and, and make hard choices um because we're you know we're already feeling it we're already feeling pinch we're you know affordability I mean, the government uh, all levels of government have been talking about uh, affordability issues uh, for the past several years. Uh, yet they keep piling on uh, more costs. You, you mentioned uh, inclusionary zoning. I mean, that's that's a whole other <laughs> topic, which um, I, I think as developers, we still haven't really wrapped our heads around. Right. So, um, yeah, uh, there, there's a lot of a uh, lot of issues at play right now, which it's it's become a, a bit of a perfect storm because. Um, just when a lot of these these new uh, policies and, and fee increases are, are are coming into play, we're we're, we're seeing these uh, you know these these rate uh, hikes. So I, I think it's just um, yeah, unfortunately, really bad timing, and uh, some some major changes are going to need to be made. So let's talk about inclusionary zoning just for a minute. Uh, and in case any of uh, our listeners don't understand. Um, and and Julian, please correct me if I, uh, I'm wrong, but inclusionary zoning is a policy that's been put in place by the city of Toronto um, and is available for other cities around Toronto, but hasn't been implemented uh, as of yet. Uh, and what it is, is it's mandating that developers put in uh, place, uh, and these are not for all developers, but for developers that develop in what's deemed to be major transit areas. So areas near um, subway stations, GO train stations, uh, LRT stations and the like, uh, 10 percent to 20 percent and that that percentage increases over time of their housing to be what is deemed affordable and it's not affordable for all of us but it's affordable for people that don't make a lot of money so it's it's not social housing but it's close to social housing and um and the board of trade and uh, bill did studies that inclusionary zoning rules have been put in place in numerous different cities around north america uh so it's not new there but what is new is that in all the cities in north america but to Toronto and Portland, um, inclusionary zoning when put in place was uh, coupled with an incentive, um, sort of like a payment uh, to the developers uh, to be okay with it. Uh, and what it was, was uh, typically an increased density such that, you know, you give uh, 10 or 20% more density, you know, 10 or 20% more more floors, and uh, please uh, provide 10 or 20% of your, um, your suites as affordable. In Toronto and Portland, we are the only two cities that did not compensate developers at all for inclusionary zoning. So what do you think, given that, Julian, is gonna happen? Yeah, you know, the, the verdict still, out. I mean, look, on, on paper, it, it just doesn't pencil out. Uh, you know, fortunately, we don't have any projects that are within the inclusionary zone at the moment. Um, so I, I personally haven't you know, uh, underwritten a project uh, that would be subject to, um, to inclusionary zoning. That being said, I have spoken to uh, to other groups that uh, are, are 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 trying to understand how that's going to impact their their performance. Again, this is something that hasn't happened yet. I mean, it, it's 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 in place, um, but uh, you know, no no new projects yet have been have been uh, affected by it. it. It's it's I think it comes into play um, in the fall. In any event, um, yeah, it's just it. it the numbers won't work. <laughs> it's as simple as that. And especially today, I mean, they, I think they would have been hard enough to achieve when, when, when the market was, uh, was in, in, in decent shape. Um, today, you know, someone's got to uh, compensate for that, the lack of, of, of value uh, or valuation to the project because of that 10% or, or 20% uh, affordability component. Um, that, that, that ultimately reduces the value of the project significantly. Um, so it, we have to make that up somewhere. So we either um, increase the the cost of the market units uh, uh, significantly, which again it kind of 
puts us out of uh, probably um, uh, viable uh, purchase price. Or, and a sense of affordability. Yeah, or, or we or cancel projects. I mean, projects are starting to get canceled in the yeah. city. Uh, so, and, and that's going to become, uh, I think, a reality uh, we'll all start hearing a lot more about very soon. You know, I did, I just... I don't understand the principle of it either. I, I apologize. I'm I'm a progressive. I firmly believe in you know affordable housing and doing things that uh, assist uh, people in society. But when we have a program that is to provide more affordable housing to people, uh, it sounds like it's something that should get funded by general revenue. It should get funded by you know all the taxpayers. If, if society decides it's a good that we should be providing, it's something that should be provided by. The taxes that everyone pays. In this case, what you're saying is that effectively it is the market um, rate buyer, the new buyer of another condo that's effectively going to have to pay a higher price, a higher tax on top of what he's already paying, whatever she's paying, uh, to compensate uh, for these affordable housing. And so it's it's regular buyers, regular new buyers, they're going to be effectively paying this extra cost, this extra tax to uh, supply the affordable units and that just doesn't seem fair like it, it it may not make sense to you as a developer but it also just doesn't seem fair yeah i agree uh, wholeheartedly and, and again i i think you know it, it's one thing if you know in compensation for the 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 inclusionary zoning component in in, in the building or project you know, the developer were were provided you know a, a density bonus or or some other um, um, amount that that would kind of compensate for for the inclusionary zoning, but if if you're just throwing the inclusionary zoning into that building, and and you're essentially losing ten to twenty percent of, of of your market rates, um, yeah, it's 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 just not going to work. We're chatting tonight with Katie Davidson of the Real Agency Brokerage and Julian Battiston, the CEO of Oben Group, a purpose built rental company. We're going to take a break for some messages and be back in just two minutes. Uh, and we're going to continue this conversation about what's going on, because you've got these countervailing forces. You've got the higher interest rates that uh, Katie has uh, told us about that are clearly impacting people's ability to carry a mortgage. And so therefore is is probably driving demand down and prices down. Uh, but at the same time, Julian's talking about all the costs um, that uh, that developers have, which means they want to increase pricing. Uh, so developers want to increase the pricing to pay for all these uh, development charges and inclusionary zoning prices and other things at the same time as uh, as Katie says that prices need to come down. Two countervailing forces, both working against the developers such that probably what's going to happen is exactly what Julian suggests, which is homes aren't going to be built, condos aren't going to be built, and this uh, need for 1.8 million new homes is going to become even larger. Sounds like a pretty tough situation. Uh, in the next little while. We're going to take a break and come back more with Julian and Katie in just two minutes, everybody. Stay with us. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour in Saga 960. We're chatting tonight about the current real estate market, which is really, um, you know, one that's uh, it's a, it's a little bit of a, a question mark. Um, and uh, our guests are Katie Davidson, who is a uh, uh, the owner of Real Agency Brokerage. She specializes in the GTA, particularly the Western GTA, but the whole GTA. Uh, and uh, Julian Battiston, who is the CEO of Oben Group that specializes in uh, purpose-built rental uh, co accommodation as well as uh, some retail. Um, and we've been talking about the impact of mortgage rates. And Katie, I want to come back to you and talk a little bit about that and stress tests and, uh, and uh, variable interest rates and fixed interest rates and all that kind of stuff and what you're advising people. But I also want to talk about real estate fees because you've got a different model um, for the way you charge real estate fees. And, you know, we've had a whole bunch of criticism uh, in the last little while about, um, you know, blind bidding and um, and and people holding back offers so they can get, um, you know, people to overbid and uh, and and and, uh, you know, fees that uh, seem outrageous uh, to uh, a lot of people that go to the the real estate agents what what's happening uh, in the real estate agency business in regards to some of those issues and and what's your position on them and what's this this new and different uh, formula that you're providing right thank you you know real estate uh, commissions are always a hot topic 
because they're, you know, it, it's never consistent when you're working, uh, interviewing agents, when you're selling your home, there's, uh, you're never, you're, everyone's getting a different rate. So there's really no transparency there. And I, I always found that that was a point of contention with me. I, I just, I always felt uh, uncomfortable, uh, you know, uh, offering one rate to one client and doing a favor and reducing it to another client. So, you know, it was very frustrating for sellers uh, because quite a bit of their equity is going into real estate commissions. And quite often the last couple of years, the market has been pretty hot and uh, homes were selling quickly. So, you know, the effort, uh, not to say that we, you know, real estate agents aren't entitled to the the work and commissions that, uh, you know, are proposed to them but at the at the same time these equity a lot of the equity was eaten up by commission uh from various uh brokerages so um for, for me i felt that it was important to offer an open transparent fee structure where it was a flat fee and it was on a sliding scale so this way all everyone paid this it, it was on my website it's every it's transparent everyone pays the same rate um now when it comes to Flat fee in a percentage or in an absolute it's dollar not a, it's it's actually a, it's in a, a dollar range so for example if you're between uh, uh 1 million and 1 million 350 you would pay a flat fee of roughly about 0.75 percent it works out to okay. um now as far as these multiple offers is bidding the last year it's been unmanageable Crazy. it's been unmanageable i've been in bidding wars uh, one house 40 plus offers I, I wouldn't even know how to advise my clients on just and blind bidding as you said you just don't know what you're going in with and it, it, there comes to a point where you have to sit the client down and explain to them that you will probably not qualify because the appraise that these properties do have to appraise, even though after you purchase them, they have to appraise and they have to qualify for the bank to loan you the money. And if it, they don't appraise, guess who's coming up with the difference? The buyer. So uh, this is this puts them in a difficult position because quite often they couldn't come up with it and or they're in breach of contract. So it, it became challenging and. It, to be honest, I'm I'm kind of happy in one sense that we have slowed down and the madness has stopped, and you know buyers have time to think, uh, do home inspections, have mortgage approvals because most of these offers are going in no conditions. So you're going in with no conditions. You don't know the home you're buying. The home you don't know if there's a leak in the basement. You don't know if there's a problem with the roof. And they're bidding one, two, three hundred thousand above asking price. So it was very difficult to even determine the value of a home at that point. So this escalated over the last two years and bringing us to the position we're at. I mean, currently we're still five point three percent above, even though the, the market has shifted. We're five point three percent above last year this time, which is still substantial. We are seeing you know incremental decreases over the last several months and I think it will continue but you know coupling the commission structure coupling the loss of value you know there's got to be some alternatives for for sellers and and buyers as well because we do offer a buyer's rebate now uh, as part of our, our program you know let me ask you uh, a question if I could how did this exist you know you think about almost any other business it's gone through significant uh um change you know you think about fees for brokerage houses they've come down stock market brokerage houses they've come down you know fees for travel agencies have come down dramatically such that you don't have travel agents anymore i understood that something like 96 or 97 percent of all homes get listed on mls so the information is there just like it is for stocks for you know you know a lot of other products why is it that fees for real estate agents seem to be that one thing that hasn't sort of met the real modern technological world that we live in and still is the fees, if not even higher than they were a generation ago. Well, I, I mean, this is a controversial topic and I don't want to get myself in trouble here because I have colleagues that I work with and we're, we all set our own fee structure. For me, you know, it was a personal choice to set a, 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 a affordable option. Uh, I saw an opportunity in the market and and I was really honestly tired of trying to manage commission structures and 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 being fair to my clients but why is it happening because they can do it 
you know there it hasn't there's 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 no regulations for what the fees if they want to charge seven they could charge there's nobody regulating this the brokerages the top brokerages aren't regulating what the fee structure is. It's really up to the agent that's listing the home. I mean, you're part of the brokerage, but you set your fee structure and a percentage of, of that, you know, obviously goes to the brokerage and there is work involved and there's costs involved and costs have gone up, you know, home staging, photography. Our, my brokerage is a full service brokerage and it, it does cost. I just take a, a, a lower margin um, versus some of the other, agents that are out there charging the full five percent that's kind of what's been going on well i so, do think that something should happen and uh and, and real estate agency fees should come down so i congratulate you for your flat fee uh, but i do think that blind bidding should be done away with i think that uh um you know some of these and and, and double what's it called double ending double ending uh, is is completely inappropriate i think and so i think that uh uh, if government doesn't get involved, uh, someone someone uh, should get involved with a new agency and uh, shake up the industry because every every other industry segment has been shaken up. Anyway, Julian, let me turn to you now and ask about rental. I thought the rental business was a crappy business because of rent control. So why are you in the purpose-built rental business? So uh, fortunately, new rental developments are not subject to rent control. Yeah. Um, you know, whether that changes sometime in the future, you know, that's always a fear of ours. <laughs> um, you know, we, there, there was uh, a time during the, the Wynn government not too long ago where uh, some, uh, you know, rent controls were, were instituted on, on, on new buildings. Um, now that has since been removed. But um, uh, yeah, it, it, look, it's it's been a steady uh, asset for for a long time. Um, and if, if you could... Uh, you know, figure out how to build a rental because, you know, it's a, it's a completely different um, uh, uh, structure, financial structure uh, than it is to, to build a condominium uh, development. If, if you could get around that, um, it, it's obviously a good, uh, a good investment, good asset to, to own. Um, rentals has traditionally been a stable place to invest uh, your money. And, uh, you know, when, when you're in, a growing uh, city like like Toronto, um, where where rents uh, you know have unfortunately have continued to go up over time. Um, you know we've we've uh, we've seen cap rates uh, come down significantly. You know about the values of these these buildings have gone up um, substantially. You know we we've got uh, you know large institutional groups that that are, are looking to to get their hands on on rental buildings for the that you know the very reason that they're stable investments over the long term and will continue uh, to produce, uh, you know, in income screen uh, streams for, well, indefinitely. So. I had uh, a conversation with someone who told me that, look, Brian, the vast majority of some of these downtown condominiums are bought by uh, investors, not by uh, owner occupiers, and they turn around and rent them and they're making a profit um, over time. And so therefore, logically, if you rent the building yourself, then, then you're effectively, capturing you know one more level of profit uh, you're you're getting rid right. of the the outside investor that's going to come in and, and charge a profit uh and so therefore yeah. the rental business is uh, is an attractive business and you can actually make uh good money and then they said something really interesting i want to check to you if this is true they said and the other thing about it is that if you don't have really good services within a, a rental apartment you get churn that is way too high. And uh, and so therefore it's built in incentive for the owner to uh, to make sure that you've got good amenities, good services, because um, Brian, if people date people in the building or do business with people in the building or make friends with people in the building, they'll stay in the building and the owner won't get churned. But if mm -hmm. all they do is come and go, then they'll get churn and uh, and they won't make as much money. So there's a built-in incentive uh, to have a really good, building manager. Does that make any sense? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, we, we started this, uh, we, we started Open Group uh, a little over 10 years ago. And, and at that time, our, our main focus, it has changed and developed over, over the years, but at, at that, that time, our main focus was to develop uh, purpose-built rental buildings because we had recognized that uh, while there was a growing number of, of people turning to the rental market, there were very few rental options available um, in, in the city. I mean, we're going back 10 years ago. No one was building new new rentals, um, uh, particularly in the, the higher end and rental segments. So uh, we, we, had, we saw this as an opportunity 
uh, to create a, uh, a rental concept that would be you know, unique to, to the Toronto market. And what our concept was, was basically to combine, you know, um, very design focused and contemporary, uh, contemporary design with a very high level of, of customer service, which again, just didn't exist. I know 10 years ago is not all that long in the grand scheme of things, but um, back then that, that, that didn't happen. So, uh, you know, we, we took a very um, kind of uh, modern approach or contemporary approach uh, to uh, rental developments. Uh, we built, uh, built into these buildings, you know, um, large amenity spaces, gyms, uh, large lobbies, party rooms, that sort of thing. We, uh, you know, we provided uh, you know free Wi-Fi in, in the lobbies to bring people down into these common areas to create a sense of community. Uh, we would regularly host uh, events, you know, functions. We'd bring in you know um, bartenders and caterers, and again, another another way to to get people uh, who live in the building uh, together and then create that sense of community. So that that was. Um, definitely uh, the, the the basis for the, our, our this rental concept that uh, uh, we entered the market with, and and you know it really it was a, it's about creating a lifestyle around rental, which again just was very novel at that time. Tell us uh, if you could about uh, one or some of your developments and where they are. Uh, so we've got our first rental development was is down in Leslieville. It's uh, ten seventy five Queen Street East. Uh, it's a uh, 51 unit uh, building. We've got retail at grade. Uh, again, a large lobby, lounge space. We've got uh, a gym, um, uh, rooftop uh, terrace, and, and, and patio with barbecue and, and, and all those uh, you know lounge chair lounge area. Uh, we've got a another building at uh, the, the St. Clair and Bathurst area. It's uh, 109 Bond Road. Uh, again, it's about it's 50 uh, 52 unit building. Um, again, these are typically uh, our units are, are slightly larger than what you may find in a, a condo building. Uh, again, all the all the same amenities. Uh, we have on-site staff, um, and, uh, and we're building out a, a, a project right now, rental project uh, in the Eglinton West area, just next to the um, Cal- future Caledonia LRT station. It's 141 units. Um, and, and again, large amenity spaces, uh, you know, full concierge, uh, once it's, once it's up and running and, uh, yeah, it's going to be a great building. So if people want to, uh, check out your buildings or your company and maybe apply to uh, rent one of your units. Uh, do you have a website that they should go to or how, yeah. how can they best contact you? We do. Uh, so our, our website is openflats.com. Openflats is our, our rental brand. And um, on, on the website there, they could register for an uh, apartment unit or a tour. Uh, and, uh, and also there's contact information uh, to our, our, our management staff. Excellent. And Katie, uh, if people are interested in, uh, in maybe accessing you and your, uh, your flat fee and your, uh, and your business um, uh, in real estate agency in the, in the GTA, how can they best contact you? They could just go to my real estate website as well, which is realagency.ca, and there's a form they could fill out, and uh, it'll come directly to me or one of the other staffers, and they will respond to them. Excellent. Well, I really appreciate uh, both of you. We're going to take another break and come back with some concluding comments in just a minute. We've been chatting tonight with Julian Battiston, uh, who is uh, the CEO of Oben Group. Uh, Oben Flats is the rental uh, Uh, arm of that organization, and Katie Davidson, who is the owner and founder and CEO of Real Agency Brokerage, a real estate agency firm in Western Toronto primarily, but covering the whole GTA. Uh, Stay with us. We're going to be back in two minutes with some concluding comments on what the heck is going to happen in this real estate market. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crumby Radio Hour on Saga 960. We're chatting tonight about everything about real estate and the real estate markets. Uh, and my guests are Katie Davidson, who is the owner of Real Agency Brokerage, a, a real estate agency brokerage organization specializing in the GTA. Uh, she's got a great fee structure. If you're interested uh, in uh, in buying or selling a house, you should contact her at realagency.com uh, or .ca? .ca. .ca. And Julian Battiston, who is the CEO of Oban a uh, group of homes, uh, Oban uh, Flats is his rental uh, organization. And uh, 
And your website is openflats.com or .ca? Dot com. Dot com, openflats.com uh, to check out some of the rental properties. Julian and Katie, um, the stock market is down 20% or so from its high. The tech market is down 35% from its high. If you take a look, and uh, you know, numerous people have done this, at comparable homes in Toronto versus um, you know, major cities in the United States, our housing is twice uh, what they would be in a major city in the United States. I'm in Florida right now, um, and you know, you can get a really good home for under a million bucks, like a really nice home for under a million bucks, if it's not on the ocean, uh, at least. Um, and uh, you know, I went through a development today, they're advertising 600 to 750,000 bucks. Now it's American dollars, but still. Um, you know, house pricing is significantly cheaper and they have mortgage interest deductibility in the United States. Uh, in, uh, in 2008, there was a fairly substantial uh, price decline in the United States. We didn't have that in Canada. Um, our price to incomes and our price to rents today are higher than they were in the United States in 2008 when they said there was this big bubble that was going to burst and ended up bursting. So my question for you is, why aren't we more worried? Why isn't this market going to go down by 20 to 30%? Because if the stock market's going down by 20 to 35%, if we're heading into a recession, if interest rates have gone up by, you know, two to 300 basis points, which is really a doubling, that's a, almost a 100% increase in variable interest rates, why aren't we going to have a 20 to 30% decline? Why isn't this going to be a bubble that bursts? Well, I think I'll just jump in, Julian, quickly. Mm -hmm. I think, I, I, I mean, going 20, 30% decline, depending on where we started from over the last two years, we had a probably a 40, 46% increase. And so our decline will happen. It's going to happen. I just don't think it's going to be as drastic. I think we're going to come back to a more normal, stabilized uh, market and I think home prices are going to kind of come back to where they were and e even interest rates interest rates were almost not I mean I, I was hearing things like 0.5 percent one percent interest rates uh, a little while back which was completely uh, unusual uh, we couldn't sustain that long term and people's buying power obviously increased so I I I believe that, you know, my feeling is that we're probably going to ride this out for a little while longer. Yes, we are going to decline, um, but not at the rate, like the, that bubble, I don't believe is going to burst. I, I feel like working with some of the banks and hearing the message that they're uh, sharing with their brokers, mortgage brokers, is that there's over in the next year, we're going to see over 1 million new immigrants coming into Canada. I think that's going to have a huge impact. We're, we're still going to need places to live. Yeah, you know, our, our job, you know, we're still going to be earning income. We're just going to adjust our expectations, I believe. Our buying power is going to get a little less and we're going to get back to a more normal, stabilized uh, value of properties. So don't worry, be happy. Well, this too shall pass. Okay. Julian, what do you think? Yeah, I, I, I agree uh, with Katie. I mean, I mean, I think it ultimately comes down to population growth, right? And and we are expecting, you know, around I think it's four hundred thousand people or so a year into to Canada, uh, which around two hundred thousand will be uh, uh, coming to Ontario, and, and that's predominantly the GTA. Um, you know, right now in the GTA, there, there are only about three or four months supply of unsold. Uh, units uh, in, in a balanced market um, that number should be somewhere around eight or nine months nice. so you know if if uh, I, I would be concerned about you know major uh, drops in, in price you know the 20 20 30 percent range as you mentioned but I, uh, I'm less concerned when I when I'm seeing this kind of uh, growth in population um, Toronto and the GTA I, I think for a long time will be a, a place where people want to come to live and work, as I mentioned before. I mean, <laughs> the reality is there aren't too many other cities in, in the world right now that I, I think I'd want to be. Uh, you know, there's there's uh, just it seems to be everything seems to be upside down. And I mean, Canada and Toronto and other places in, in, in Canada, uh, I think, are, are attractive destinations for um, a lot of other people right now in, in the world. And uh so yeah, I, 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 I'm. It will be a you know a bumpy road in the short term. Definitely, uh, we're going to need to feel the pain. I think until 
um, uh, you know, things like supply costs, uh, contractor costs, you know, the, 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 the construction costs themselves, uh, it's always kind of a long uh, lead indicator. So once, uh, once uh, projects I think, start slowing down, uh, we're going to see costs ultimately start slowing down and it'll, it'll get us back to a bit more of a balanced market. Katie Davidson, Real Agency Brokerage, uh, Julie Battiston, Julian Battiston of Oban Group. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate your uh, thoughts on the real estate market. Um, if you want my two cents worth, uh, everybody out there, and uh, you probably don't, but uh, I'll give you my two cents worth. Um, I think we're in for a really tough uh, ride. Um, the market went down by 20, 25% in 1990. Not everyone was expecting it. A lot of people said it wouldn't happen. There was one economist on, on Bay Street that called for it and it happened. Uh, and uh, and it was shocking to the marketplace. Uh, and it took a while to come back. Um, I think that uh, psychology in real estate, particularly given some of the inefficiencies that we chatted about with Katie, um, occurs in 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 more than this market than almost any other market because of uh, uh, it's 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 not an efficient market like uh, the stock market is. It's difficult and has been difficult to get information on pricing, um, uh, and uh, and and you know you don't see a ticker tape that uh, shows you uh, bid by bid, uh, second by second for the different uh, homes that are there in the marketplace. And so because it was so cheap, I think we overbid uh, dramatically. And and when you think it's going up and it's going to be a lot more expensive, like 20% more expensive next year, you buy now. Uh, that's a logical um, thing for a person to do. But when you think there's a chance that it could be 10 or 20% lower and your interest rate uh, and your mortgage rate is going up and you can't get uh, a mortgage, uh, a bank appraisal, uh, and all of a sudden some people who bought in the last six months don't have any equity left in their home because the value of their home has gone down to the equal to or below the level of their mortgage. I think we're going to have a lot less investors that are coming into the marketplace. Um, we're going to have a lot less flipping. Uh, and there's been like, I know so many real estate agents that have been flipping homes in the last uh, couple of years. So you're going to have a lot less flipping. Um, I think that, uh, we are, yes, going to have immigration. 400,000 people are supposedly what uh, the Liberal government has announced uh, are going to come, and some percentage of those are going to come uh, to Toronto. Uh, we're going to have all the issues uh, that uh, Julian and I talked about in regards to excess homes. But the prices that people are willing to pay, given the dramatic increases in mortgage costs, and they're not coming down soon. You know, uh, CPI is 8 9%. Um, and we're going to see uh, Federal Bank, uh, uh, Central Bank, European Bank, and the Bank of England all increasing interest rates more this year to try to get inflation out of the system. Um, I think this is going to be a really tough year in the real estate business. But, Julian, I think that means that there's a whole bunch of people that aren't going to buy. So they're going to want to rent. So you're going to yeah. be doing great. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> I'll let you know. Anyway, that's our show for tonight. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Katie and Julian, thank you so much. I remind you, I'm on every Monday through Friday at 6 o'clock on 960 AM. You can stream me online at www.saga960am.ca. All my podcasts and videocasts are available on briancrombie.com. The videos are on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and LinkedIn. And the podcasts are on everywhere. Podcasts uh, are uh, available. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. That's going to be a great long weekend coming up. Enjoy yourselves, everyone. And go to a couple open houses and call up Katie and get her to show you some homes. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thanks, Brian. Good night.